Welcome to the class. I look forward to getting to know you and learning from each of you individually. First off, a couple of housekeeping items. The reading list on the syllabus appears daunting, but let me assure you it's very manageable. Most weeks it consists of a handful of short chapters from the assigned books and another handful of brief web articles with the URLs provided. Secondly, as we are at the moment a class of 10. I would like to invite each of you to make a YouTube as part of your class presentation. The heart of our work will be in the text discussions appropriate to each week, but consider a YouTube for stimulating an interesting breakout discussion or to make an in-depth presentation on one of the topics. While I can't offer technical support, for YouTube. Suffice to say, every 12 seconds about 1,500 12-year-olds upload, upload a new YouTube. In this way, we are feeding two birds with one seed. We are engaging in dharmic discussions, itself a cause for happiness, and we are pushing the edges of the internet as a useful forum for group learning and interaction. Social change and Buddhism have been topics of discussion in Buddhism since the time of the Buddha himself and in the first gatherings of those who had followed Siddhartha into homelessness. The Buddha, as evidenced in the sutras, was quite active in the affairs of men, advising kings, intervening in struggles between states, giving economic and political advice, etc. One caveat about sutra or text-based Buddhist truth. Thankfully, the Buddha in his wisdom recognized that truth is relative and in a world of changing conditions, the rules of the game need adjustment from time to time. For this reason and perhaps others, the Buddha was quite firm about refusing to codify the teachings in written form nor was he inclined to allow his image to be used in any way to represent the teachings. His wishes were respected even 100 to 200 years after his death. The teachings were recited in the form of chants and songs, and the monks passed them down to the next generations in that form. Undoubtedly, the chants themselves were subject to edits over time, and the Buddha even encouraged the Sangha to meet regularly and consider changes to the Vinaya, the code of behavior of the monks. The monks made decisions in democratic fashion, and even the high monks and elders had no more power in the process of reaching consensus than the newest of monks. So while the word of the Buddha is not definitive, we have a good sense of what his teachings were from the many thousands of commentaries made by learned monks over time, and the basic Dhamma as found in the Pali Canon, which is still chanted by Theravadan monks to this day. There is little dispute with the fact that the Buddha himself was an activist and took on the challenge of what is essentially a reformation of Brahmanism and the religious establishment at the time. But there is found in the text a great deal of wisdom about the nature of and limits to Buddhist activism, the problem of being impassioned about beliefs, confusing one's convictions with identity, the fact that we do not exist in an isolated, independent way from all others, and the need to keep the overarching goal in sight, the purification of one's own mind. For this week, what I will ask you to do is look through the readings and then build a case, one way or the other, based on the teachings and your understanding of them, as to whether or not social activism is a right endeavor in Buddhist practice, and if it is, how can it be distinguished from generic activism? This will be the heart of our online discussions this week. Again. Welcome aboard, and please contact me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you.